Hello, and welcome to my lecture on New American Poetry. Whitman and Dickinson are the focus of this particular module. And I'm going to start by offering a little comparison on Whitman and Dickinson. Whitman, of course, is, is a public poet. His, his poetry is very much uh, meant to be um, in the public realm. Uh, he is a self-promoter. He self-publishes his work. Uh, you know, he wants to be well known. He writes his own reviews. He writes his own reviews and gets his own reviews published. He he wants to to sell his poetry. He wants people to read his poetry. Whereas Emily Dickinson is very much a private poetry. A few of her poems are published uh, during her lifetime, but for the most part, her poetry is a secret. Whitman is the poet of outwardness. He is writing about the world. He is writing uh, about the world around him, um, the, the physical world. Whereas Emily Dickinson is writing about her inner life and about the. And, and, and when she does write about nature, she writes about it very microscopically, very much in detail. They're very much contrasting in just the way their poetry looks and the way it reads. Whitman writes in very long lines, uh, and his poetry is very much inclusive. He has long lists or catalogs, whereas Emily Dickinson's writing is very short, clipped phrasing, uh, very economical in the, her choices of words, and she has a very, very narrow focus. Um, you know, very Emersonian in his, his outlook, um, and he's very hedonistic. He's very physical, very sensual. Um, Dickinson is very much in sort of the Calvinist vein, uh, the 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 black and the white, the uh, the the God and angels and devils and demons. Um, but she also uh, differs from that in that her religion is kind of a homemade religion. She has her own doubts and ideas about faith. Whitman sees uh, in, in death and life a duality. One of the sections I have you read from Song of Myself talks about death being luckier than anyone had supposed. It talks about the sort of the cycle and the circle of life and death. Whereas with Dickinson, death is indeed the end. It's the absolute end, possibly. Whitman is very sensual again, very sexual, very openly sexual. Whereas Dickinson is very reserved for the most part and very cold for the most part. Now we're going to look at one of her, her poems that is very passionate, Wild Nights. So this is not always the case. So that's a quick overview of the two poets who really revolutionized American poetry and, and created an American poetry tradition that was really separate, completely divorced from the British poetic tradition. Let's look at Whitman first, specifically. He was a public poet, as I said, a city poet. His focus was on outwardness, was on democracy. The quote from him to keep in mind is, I am vast, I contain multitudes. The purpose of Leaves of Grass, um, the purpose of the, the main poem in it, Song of Myself, which he wrote and rewrote many times over, was to create a poem of America. The Song of Myself was not just the song of Walt Whitman, but it was the song of Walt Whitman, I, Walt Whitman, an American. Um, to contain all of America within one poem really was his mission there. And uh, he was someone who believed in the democratic mission of America to his very core. He was a transcendentalist. He was a follower of Emerson. He was a philosophical follower of, of Emerson as well as a literary follower of Emerson. And he really felt like in a lot of ways that he was the poet that Emerson had spoke of. Uh, the new original voice, the new American voice that would speak of things in a new way, that would look on the world with the new eyes, with the eyes of a child, but more than the eyes of a child, the eyes of, of a real man. Um, his influences, besides Emerson, were, were many. He was influenced by political speech and oratory. He was influenced by the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, so he uses biblical sort of voice, biblical syntax. He went to the opera. He was he was influenced by 
the sound of opera and and, and op- operatic sort of uh, uh, tones of, of language. He was influenced by uh, journalism. He was a journalist, so he was influenced by that sort of rhetoric, as well as the fact that he set his own type for the initial run of Leaves of Grass. So he was... Um, actually influenced by the fact that he could set long lines of type. Uh, so, you know, this this idea of free verse being set, you know, beyond the, the, the normal sort of lines of poetry, um, sort of being sort of choppy lines of poetry, he would write these really, really, really long lines that normally you wouldn't see being set the way they were set. He could sort of set the lines of type the way he wanted to set them. Um, so he was kind of influenced by the process of itself. Um, he wrote in these long lines because that's the way that people talked. You know, him being a journalist, he wanted to, you know, mimic the way that people talked. It was the way that that politicians, you know, spoke in you know political rhetoric. Um, it was also what he wanted to do as far as being able to include as many ideas as possible in this sort of verbal landslide of information. Um, So, you know, that was important to him, being able to sort of, you know, just sort of regurgitate all of this information and this sort of exhaustive flow. Uh, Philosophically, uh, some ideas that were important to him included this duality of life and death, and that's emphasized in the sections from Song of Myself that I I had you guys read. Um, And also this idea of hedonism and sensuality, pleasures of the flesh, pleasures of the self. And this idea of there being no division between the soul and the self, a very Emersonian idea of, of the self. Going along with that, one of the things that I like to have the class look at, although I didn't necessarily I didn't assign this for you guys to read, is the letter to Emerson, which appears in the second version of Leaves of Grass, the second publication of Leaves of Grass, where he... Uh, repeats Emerson's call for a new American literature. This letter to Emerson is Whitman's real manifesto for a new literature. He talks about the mighty inheritance of the English language. He acknowledges the past, but he says that the past is just a preparation for our new literature, that America requires a new literature because America is such a great country. America deserves a new literature, and it deserves writers to move beyond just copying or stealing from the past. And it also requires American writers to move beyond censorship, and even the, even if it's self-censorship, it it move it means writing honestly about things like sexuality and sensuality. And that was one of the things that Emerson had a problem with in Whitman's writing. Uh, Emerson felt like Whitman was going too far too fast. And that's why Whitman writes this letter to Emerson explaining that, you know, this is what I need to do. This is what we need to do to forge ahead in a new American literature. We have to write honestly. We have to forge ahead. Now, I had you read several sections from... Uh, Song of Myself, which is the first poem and the longest poem in Leaves of Grass. And Leaves of Grass is the the big book that Whitman continuously writes and rewrites throughout his life, uh, continuously revises throughout his life. Uh, first published in 1855, um, Song of Myself isn't titled actually until the 1871 edition of the book. Um, but Song of Myself is really the, the poem in which uh, Emerson's philosophies are made into poetic realities. And you'll see that. I think there'll be several instances where, and you should probably do this as you're reading the poems, um, you can make notes to yourself and, and see where some of the ideas from nature that you read you know, come crashing through, I think, you know, very clearly. Uh, in in Whitman's writings. And each section can be read as a separate poem. Uh, Of course, I recorded uh, them so that you could hear them rather than just read them because I think that makes a huge amount of difference. And one of the things that I that I I like to do in class is is read them out loud in class, have students read them out out loud in class, 
talk about them because to hear them is, is really really makes a huge amount of difference. So each section can be read as a separate poem, but they do all work together to create a picture of Whitman himself because it is a song of myself and also his vision of America because it's not just a song of himself, but it's a song of his vision of America as a democracy and as a diverse country with diverse peoples and diverse goals and a diverse landscape, uh, it's, it's, it's really it's, it's just an incredible poem. You'll find lecture notes on all the other sections in Dr. Cody's lecture notes, as I explained in the little preface to the module. But I have some specific notes that I wanted to give you on two of the sections, and those are sections 7 and 11. Uh, section 7... Um, that I wanted to, wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? Um, that is a, a, my favorite section. Uh, and it includes, includes some of my favorite lines, uh, such as, uh, I am not contained between my hat and hat and boots. Uh, I think is, is a wonderful, wonderful encapsulation of this idea of that I am not just this person. You know, I am not just this physical thing. I am also the the soul that resides within me and also without me. And you'll find several parts uh, or several times in the sections you read of Song of Myself where he talks about uh, or refers to an other. He refers to uh, a man that he's with uh, or a lover that he's with. And don't think of that as a physical lover. He's talking about his soul. He's talking about his other self, and he's you know he's referring to that other self, um, and that's that's his soul. That's his uh, his his other nature, uh, to use an Emersonian term. Uh, that's the part of himself that is not only contained between his hat and his boots. That sometimes spreads beyond him that sometimes spreads and there's there's another section where it talks about sometimes it reaches uh, within him through his uh, through his shirt and and kisses down to his to his bare stripped heart and uh, reaches from the top of his head down to the bottom of his boots um, so that's that's his soul so so don't think that you're reading something sexual there. Uh, although it's done in very sensual terms. Um, also in section 7, uh, where he talks about all the different people, all the different uh, the genders, um, the mothers and women, um, and the physical bodies. That's another thing I think is important about section 7, is his identification with not just with men, but also with women, um, and this idea of not being ashamed of oneself. And that's another, the reason that I, I focus on section 7 and section 11 is this idea of him wanting to look past shame. I think he sees that as an essential problem with mankind, is this idea of, of shame, is that we should get beyond this idea of shame, uh, that it keeps us from doing things that we really have, we have no business not doing, uh, enjoying ourselves, for, for one thing. Um, you know, in, in keeping from doing the things that we really ought to do and that other people would like us to be able to do. Uh, getting beyond this idea of shame. And he says, Undrape, you are not guilty to me, nor stale, nor discarded. So he's not necessarily saying, you know, get naked. He's just saying, you know, you don't need to hide yourself from me. You don't need to hide who you are from me because I don't find you distasteful in any way. Moving on to section 11, which is really one of my favorite sections, and that is of the, the bathers. Um, talking about the 29th bather, the voyeur, the woman who is watching, um, this idea of the, the observer versus the participant, um, you know, who this woman is and what she represents, you know, that she's watching these men in the water. Um, and, and Whitman, as the speaker, is watching her watch them. And he imagines her imagining herself 
out there running out there with them. And it's, it gets a little complicated and it can be confusing. So that's why I chose to, to explain that this one a little bit more. Uh, but that, that's what's going on here is he is imagining, um, he's, he's, he's looking at her who is, is up in this house. Uh, he's seeing her looking down at the ocean, watching the men uh, playing out, playing down in the ocean together. And then he's imagining her, imagining herself going down there and being with them. He's imagining her being the 29th bather. So, you know, they don't see her down there with him, with them because she's not down there with them, but she's imagining herself down there with them. So she, um, you know, she is not participating. She is watching. But in a lot of ways, she is like Whitman, right? Because Whitman, as the poet, is an observer and not necessarily a participant. Um, he is, you know, the poet who is watching the things go go on and describing them to us, but he's not necessarily in the middle of the action. Um, and in a lot of ways, too, you know, that's really what... Um, sort of that Emersonian idea of the transparent eyeball is too, right? Is that, you know, you are in the middle of what's going on and the world is going on around you, but you are not necessarily in, you're in the world, but you're not necessarily of the world. And that's really, it's it's an interesting situation that he's putting the sort of 29th bather in, because in, in a lot of ways, it's sort of the same situation that the poet is in as well, which is why I wanted to focus on that. So, you know, just like you to think about that maybe a little bit more. So now we move on to Emily Dickinson. Very different from Walt Whitman. Uh, a secretive poet, a secretive person. Uh, very much like Ed- Edward Taylor, the Puritan poet from early on. Uh, Emily Dickinson kept her poetry, for the most part, very secret. It was a moral secret because if... Uh, people in her family had read some of the poetry that she'd written, they might not have liked what they'd read about, so the way that she questioned faith and wrote about her father, etc. Um, it wasn't until much later that her poetry was published, you know, after her death, and it wasn't even until a lot later that it was published in the way that it was originally written um, because of the fact that she rejected conventional punctu- punctuation. A lot of her poetry was kind of cleaned up, so uh, when it was published uh, in an uncleaned up version much later on of course her reputation grew and grew and grew her poems originally had her poems originally had no titles they were numbered uh, by Mabel Loomis Todd and then later by other critics and so that's why there are two different numbers in your anthology Uh, so I went by the anthology's numbers although there are other numbers and I refer to them by the titles as well in in this slideshow Um, she uses a dash but she uses it in a lot of different weird ways so they are difficult poems to read aloud and I read them all aloud for you to listen to although the way I'm reading them are is based on interpretation. Uh, I do my best based on how I interpret the dashes and interpret her punctuation to read them the way I would think that they should be read. Um, She uses a lot of hymn-like phrasing. Um, You think of... uh, Think of him like phrasing. I think your your text talks about this. Think of like the yellow rose of Texas, um, as as amazing grace. Think of those those tunes as sort of the way that they would be phrased, and you can sort of hear it in your head as how the, the rhythms would go, not the melodies, but the rhythms would go. Um, she does have a lot of romantic longing in her poetry, uh, a lot of doubt as far as the themes go. Uh, God as a dark father, uh, her own father as God as well is, is, a, is a theme. Um, a lot of contradictions as far as the metaphysical goes, as far as life after death and no life after death. Uh, a lot of ambiguities, you know, is there uh, is there a God? Is there not a God? Uh, is she, is, does she have faith? Does she not have faith? Um uh, is she uh, experiencing romantic love? Is she not experiencing romantic love? And the possibilities of actual inner liberation. 
that she's someone who is actually experiencing a very rich inner life, although her outer life to all those around her who knew her seemed to be very, very limited, very, very narrow. Uh, from her poetry, she seemed to be having this very, very rich inner life. And, uh, you know, she was possibly very much influenced by the philosophies of people like Emerson. Uh, she might have been sort of a closet transcendentalist, although a lot of her poetry seemed to be very Calvinist in nature. For details on most of the poems that were assigned to you, you can look at Dr. Cody's lecture notes. But I chose uh, three poems that were not uh, on the, in the original American Lit module that I wanted to focus on. And uh, so I've got them by title listed uh, in the in the notes. I never lost as much, but twice as the first one. Uh, of course, that's a really good example of the hymn meter that she uses. You could actually sing that along with uh, with the Yellow Rose of Texas. Don't try that because you'll never be able to keep a straight face with it anymore. But it was it's a it's a great example of the, the sort of ambiguity in her writing and also the power of her writing. Um, you know, this is sort of the unnamed something that she loses. I never lost as much but twice, uh, and that was in the sod. Uh, never lost as much. What is it that she loses as much? We don't know. It's this unnamed something that she loses in the sod. Well, the sod is the ground. It makes it implies that it's something that has died, but it never specifically says. It is, it is utterly ambiguous. Uh, she is a beggar before God, which makes you think, well, she's asking something from God. Um, she uh, has angels, you know, restore something to her. Is it faith that is restored to her? We don't know. Um, and then, you know, uh, she cries out. She cries out to uh, to Father. Um, is, is the Father the same as God? We don't know. And then she is poor again. She is she is poverty stricken yet again from the banker slash father slash possibly God. So a great example there of her ambiguity and the power of her writing and the musicality of, of the rhythm there as well. Um, the next poem that I that I wanted you to focus on is Wild Nights, which is one of my favorites. Um, a great example of sort of the passion in her writing from somebody who's usually considered to be a very cold writer. Um, the repetition at the very beginning, Wild Nights, Wild Nights, Where I With Thee. Uh, and wild nights are luxury, right? Luxury, right? We can we can relax, we can luxuriate, we can uh, you know just sort of abandon ourselves. Um, they are they're done with the compass and done with the chart. They don't need to go anywhere else, right? You don't need a compass or a chart. A chart is a map, right? You don't need a compass. You don't need to know if you're going in the right direction. You don't need a map because you you're already where you belong because you've reached your destination. Um, rowing in Eden, you are in paradise. Eden is in paradise. Uh, you know if 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 you would be able to moor tonight in thee. So it's all a big if. It's, you know, if if you were able to be with that someone. It's the you know, that idea of longing, you know, uh, wild nights were I with thee. You know, if I was be able to be with you, that's what I would be able to have. And finally, a certain slant of light, which I think is just incredibly powerful and sad uh, poem, a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, uh, the, the heft of cathedral tunes. It's just, you know, this, this, the weight and lightness at the same time, the slant of light, which is incredibly light. A certain slant of light, winter afternoons. You can imagine walking across uh, sort of a field, a barren field, and, and getting sort of a winter afternoon light sort of, sort of passing across. And then... You know, the heft of cathedral tombs, you can imagine being in this huge old church, like Gothic church, with an organ playing or something like that. Sort of the contrast of that is just amazing. And somehow it, it, it works. And there's this heavenly hurt and the sealed despair. So somehow all these things work together. Um, and it's just, I find that to be an incredibly powerful poem. And, 
and I'm interested in hearing, you know, on the discussion boards of what you think about about that particular poem. In wrap up, uh, the importance of Whitman and Dickinson, I think that it really can't be understated. Um, they they revolutionized American poetry. There was no one like them before. Um, they were incredibly influential on everyone afterwards. Uh, no one wrote the same after they read Whitman or Dickinson. Um, they it completely divorced American poetry forever from the British tradition. Um, they were two unique characters with absolutely unique voices, and they really created the two distinct threads of American poetry. Uh, for Whitman, he created public oratorical poetry. There was, you know, political poetry was created by Walt Whitman. Um, there wouldn't have been an Allen Ginsberg. Um, there wouldn't have been the 60s beat poets. Uh, there wouldn't have been um, any of those those poets if, if there hadn't have been a Walt Whitman. Um, and Emily Dickinson created private confessional poetry. There wouldn't have been any, there wouldn't have been a Sylvia Plath. There wouldn't have been basically any of our, uh, you know, modern American poets today, Mark Sands, anybody, if, if it hadn't been for Emily Dickinson. ¶¶